the third Welcome to the third block of the first session of this Congress. So we have three uh, speakers uh, today. We have uh, first Professor Andres Botero Bernal from uh, the University of Santander in Colombia. <clears throat> and we have uh, after a Professor uh, Botero Bernal, we have a Professor Carlo Gamba Gambarino uh, from the Università Bocconi and Asia Astruc from the University of West Indies. So welcome, uh, uh, Professor Potero Bernal. Hello to all. Um, could you hear me, please? Could you yeah. hear me? Is, is yeah, very good? Though. Okay, perfect. Well, in this case, I, I would like to, to share my paper with you. Uh, please give me uh, one second. Okay, is there? Could you see my, my paper, the world? Could you see? Okay. And could you hear me? Is, is, is okay the sound? Okay, perfect. In this case, we can we can start. Well, in, in first place, uh, thank you very much to Jorge Nunez. Thank you, thank you very much for for this for this invitation, and and well, I'm very happy for to get this opportunity to share with you my my research about Kelsen and specifically a debate between Kelsen and Hart. Thank you, thank you very much, Jorge, for your invitation, and we can begin. Well, please give me a second. Okay. Um, my paper, the title of my paper is, is, is this one, The Kelsen Hart Debate on Normative Sanction, A Look Beyond the Last of the Mohicans. This paper mentioned the debate between Kelsen and Hart about the sanction, punishment, as a structural element or not of the juridical norm. Future, this work pointed out that this debate reflects, among other things, the different philosophical foundation of both authors, the difference between the cultural conception of love in continental Europe and England, and it shows, or this paper shows, that Hart tried to purify some of the Kelsenian position in order to consolidate positivism and to locate it better in the context of the common law. Um, pardon me. I, I, basis on the above, this paper affirms that positivists in general and Hartian thinking in particular are not on the verge of extinction, that Hart was not the last of the Moicans, despite what is usually affirm, affirmed in this respect from some contemporary neoconstitutionalists and non positivist theories. Well, First one, Hart has gone down in the history of philosophy of law in a differentiated, differentiated way according to the reading that has been imposed on him in the juridical culture of our time. One reading is the one that circulates between the fields of lawyers training, specifically in Colombia, in which rather leaves attention paid to the historicity of the, our discipline in general and of philosophy of, of love in particular. On the one that predominates in the territories of the philosopher of law in a strict sense, those who are ready in a position to affect the educational environment of future lawyers are ready because those environments consider philosophy of law as a minor knowledge and because the gap between a scholar and non-scholar makes communication almost impossible. The fifth reading, which in the end is the most decisive due to its broad cultural effects, knows about hard but limited, limited to the debate he had with Dworkin, a debate that, that is read, um, read most of the time at least in Latin American, well, neoconstitutionalism has, has had such a pause, such as the confrontation of the last of the Moicans, 
a, a, in this case, a, a referred to heart versus Hercules, I refer to Dworkin. This first is described among others by Lloredo and, uh, another, uh, and another authors. I am seriously concerned that, that this reading is not only the one that predominates in the fields of training new layers. Uh, I say that specifically in Colombia, um, circulating the Faculty of Law in Colombia, that Hart is the last of the positivist theories. But also that, um, but also that it ends up being the one that imposes for the future doctrinal corpus of the philosophy of law when it refers to what happened in discipline, discipline in the second half of the 20th century. The second reading, um, the second reading, typical of a specialist, clearly knows that Hart was more than, than what was previously said, is such a way that it occurs with reason the fifth reading because it reduces the English author in his angers to create adequate basic schemes that can be memorized with the teaching increasingly restricted from the humanities to the interior of the law school, considering him as Dworkin Fire contradictor and as the last column of the Positivist edifice. The specialist knows that Hart has no place the role of the last of the Mohicans who wishes to survive in the face of the unbeatable impulse of not positive in civilization, signs at less in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. Legal positivism, as a theory of the existence of law and juridical system, is the dominant position for some, or at less very strong for others, represented by authors such as Joseph Raz, Andre Marmo, Wilfried Valushov, uh, John Gardner, Leslie Green, and Ken Hema, among many others, who, uh, those who had continued with the heart and through without dunning the right of the credit, of course. Even contemporary natural lobbyists in this tradition. I am thinking of John Finney and Mark Murphy to give two cases, and not positivists, such as uh, Kevin Toe and Stefan Eschkarafa, assuming that the Hartian theory is more or less fundamentally correct, a throwing complex as regards the justification of the juridical system. So, what can we do? It will be naive to consider that the fifth reading will spontaneously fade as more experts write about it. It is necessary to put in evidence, but for broader audience, through things of heart and through that may interest contemporary law student and professor to distort the erroneous image that positivism is almost extinct like the Mohicans on the one hand, and then the heart went through only gave for a debate with Dworkin on the other. Well, I, I need to explain mm, this point because I know that is very different, the tradition in England or tradition in Europe that the tradition, the philosophy, the positive philosophy of law in Latin America, specifically in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and in other countries. Um, in this country, in the, like Colombia, for example, um, circulate the idea, the idea that the positive is dead or the positive is in is in the in the last moment. Um, the, the specific reason for this idea in, in Latin American uh, philosophy of law is because here in this country in this continent is very strong the Jews naturalist theories and the neo-constitutionalist theories. Mm, and for, for this reason, I, I need to defend the positive ends in front of my colleagues here in my continent. I know that in Europe is very different. Well, continue. Now, I am referring to the debate he had with Kelsen on sanction norms, which highlights, first, 
the distance between these two authors especially due to their different philosophical influence, which constitute a teaching for a philosophy of law. Second, the role that her played as a consolidator, this is my, uh, this is my principal topic or target of this paper, um, I repeat, second, the role that Har played as a consolidator of the legal positivism in his time, which implies a teaching for the history of philosophy of law. And third one, the difference in the cultural conception of law between the continental juridical system and common law, which serves as a teaching for comparative law. Um, um, I pretend to relation the comparative law, history of philosophy of law and philosophy of love in this paper. Well, second chapter, the hard Kelsen debate on the structure of norms. Please give me a second for, a, for this coffee. This is a Colombian coffee. <laughs> well, Har was decisive in the consolidation of the normative position of Kelsen in its final phases. That is, the one that correspond to the work of Kelsen once he settled in the United States. Har achieved via the sharp criticisms and pertinent controversy that he liked so much, several clarification and even correction by Kelsen himself against his Heinrich Schlere, um, in general, and the theory regulation in particular, which allowed his work not only to consolidate itself better in the face of criticisms, but also to adapt itself to new scenarios that it was supposed to demonstrate it. As Kersen tried, that his theory, being general, was also applicable to common law. These criticisms of Hart to Kelsen can focus on several fields, but I would like to highlight for the moment three aspects. First one, what is the basic norm of the juridical system? Second one, what is the unity of the normative system? And third one, what is the former structure of the juridical norm? These three aspects, which have been well, uh, well studied by the expert, cannot be interpreted, interpreted as a quest for the destruction of the Rainer Rachelere, because Hart believed that the general Kelsenian through, through in general terms was correct, and furthermore was aware of that Kelsen was a crucial support for positivists in the context of common law, especially in his fight against dogmatisms derived from the own tradition that both faces. Reuter, rather, it will be about important conceptual qualification under the analytical aegis that so critically the consolidation of a general position, positivists, but recognizes that the Rainer Rechlere had, according to the English, some comprehensive limitation of the normative phenomenon typical of the Anglo-Saxon system, but that they did not compromise the general validity of the common matrix that united them, common matrix that leads them to the an author who influenced both of them so much, John Austin. I would like to explain better the aforementioned in relation to the theory of the previous points, the structure of the juridical norms in the strict sense. Kelsen considered initially that any juridical norm to be such implies a sanction or punishment for the transgression, that is, a prohibition based on an state threat to the whoever transgresses the basic imperative of the legislator that later in a broad sense. Said with an example of a manual, a juridical norm will be the sanction, prison sentence, for example, to whoever transgresses an imperative 
not to kill. If, uh, if continue with my example. In search, a why that the norm could be logically explaining from two mandates governed by the principle of imputation and not of cause, um, causality. The fears will be done. Uh, do, um, the fears will be that of what you want to be done or not done. You must not to kill. And the second will be in the strict sense, sense the through juridical rules, which establish the duty of punishment whoever transgresses the first imperative or imperative base. Whoever kills another must be punished with a prison sentence of so many to so many years in prison, when depends of each, uh, uh, for each country. Even this position that the law is made up of prohibiting norms led the Austrian author to propose the thesis of the competence of the law insofar as what is not prohibited is understood to be allowed. It such a way that nothing escaped the regulation of law, either it is prohibited or it is allowed. Consequently, there will be no gaps since the law is always a complete order which generated a series of criticism which we will not be able to state because they diver us from our interests. However, the principle of competence was abandoned, um, was abandoned, um, abandoned, but its own author almost of the end on his academic life. Returning to the theory of norms, especially if expect that every norm is a prohibition vacated by ascension, Hart called it and attention by asking himself what to do with those norms typical or juridical system based more on the principle of collaboration that in the prohibition, prohibition, that they do not sanction the transgression, but that they reward, allow, authorize, or inform from the law on how to obtain a result. It is that accepting non-prohibiting norms will mean question not only the coercity, the structure of the norm, but also the theory of the completeness of the juridical system. In this way, for Hart, in one looks from the social practice of a participant in the system, not all norms obey the Kelsinian structure at mass, only the norms that are called primary rules, which are those social rules that are applied in certain primary contexts, which have the object, directory or indirectory, they regulate human behavior, but imposing obligation. Even when a primary norms order to obey another, human behavior continue to be the main addresses. Then, uh, thing among the norms that do not correspond to the Kelsenian coercity the structure are the rules whose juridical consequence will be a reward on the one hand and the secondary roles of exchange, adjudication and recognition, recognition whose juridical consequence will be a power against primary rules on the other, on the other hand. Phases with these skins of rules, Hart wrote, quote, but there are important cases of law where this analogy with other brackets by threats are together fails since they perform a quite different social function. Legal rules defining the ways in which valid contracts or wills or marriage are made do not require person to act in certain ways whether they wish to or not. Such law to not impose duties or, or, or obligation. Instead, they provide individuals with facilities for realizing their wishes by conferring legal powers upon, upon them to create. 
but certainly specific procedures and subject to the same condition, a structures of rights and duties, that is, we are the coercive frameworks of the law. The power thus conferred of individuals to mold their legal relation with others by contracts, wills, marriage, etc., is one of the great contribution of law to social life, and it is a feature of law obscurity by representing a law as a meta of order baked by threats. Furthermore, this positive sanction scheme is seen more clearly with secondary roles understood as accepted social practice from the internal point of view that is from the system participant, participants. Through with establish the creation, adjudication and recognition of what is and therefore what is not juridical norm. The rules of chains will be mandated that in social practice determine, determine the way to create, modify or extinguish primary rules. That is the power to an individual or body of person to introduce new primary rules for the conduct of the life of the group or, or of some class with it and to eliminate all rules. Um, end of the quote. Thus of adjudication are, are those that, quote, empowering individuals to make authoritative determination of the question whether on a particular occasion, a primary rule has been broken. And finally, the theories will be the base norm for the juridical system insofar as it allows the social group to recognize a primary rule uh, in such a way that is the, quote, ultimate rule of the system or criterion of validity. Um, verifiable insofar this is a matter of fact. This rule appears to impose a duty of adjudication to apply the recognized primary, um, primary rules. The common characteristics of these second rules, as I have already said, is that they not correspond to the Kelsenian scheme in general, to that of a norm and propositional must be without contact with reality, and especially to that of a norm negative or norm sanction proper to understand the law only as a coercion. Um, Sorry, Andres, Ruth, I have to interrupt you. We have only 20 minutes for, for questions. It's up to you if you want to continue or you you want to resume a little for... for... Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, how many minutes uh, I have, excuse me? 20. 20, 20. 20 okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. perfect. Well, I, I will try to, to finish the second chapter and I will go directly to the conclusion, okay? Yeah, for going to uh, questions, okay? Perfect. Um, um, well, I, I, I was the... Um... Andrés, to, para ser precisos, tenés en total 35 sí. minutos. Sí, sí, I, I know it. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, I, I continue, um, but... I, 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 well, I, I continue with this, this phrase. Um, <laughs> I was <will> lost. <laughs> the, the common characteristics of these secondary rules, as I have already said, is that they do not correspond to the, to the Kelsenian scheme, in general to that of norm as a propositional must be without contact with reality and especially to that of a norm negative or norm sanction proper to understand the law only as a coercion. And they do not correspond because the consequence of those rules in a broad sense consists in the power to create, modify, extinguish, validate, or resolve conflicts by applying primary rules. Consequently, for Hart, uh, do this human, uh, human heritage, not all the rules can be reduced to being mer well, mere prohibition with coercitive mandate in this strict sense. Since that will mean, on the one hand, the impossibility to, of explaining in social practice, first, cert uh, certain rules, social reward and secondary rules, and on the other hand, second, the presence of the moral essence in law. Now, 
Kelsen, realizing this stringent force of the Hartian critic, which implies, among other things, a challenge for the applicability of the Rainer Rechlere in the context of the common law, and in order to maintain the uniformity of his model, considered in its second edition of the Rainer Rechlere in, in the 60s, the norms with positive sanction as incomplete norms or non-independent norms, which, however, only becomes complete or independent ones can be articulated with a negative sanction with a coercion. Uh, I quote Director Kelsen, uh, quote, it follows that a legal order may be characterized as coercive order, even through note at its norm stipulate coercive acts, because norms that do not themselves stipulate coercive acts and hence do no comment, but authorize the creation of norm or positively permit a definitive behavior are dependent norms, valid only in connection with norms that do stipulate coercive acts. Again, not all norms that stipulate a coercive act, but only those that stipulate the coercive acts as a reaction against a certain behavior. That is a sanction, common and specific, and namely the opposite behavior. To understand the importance of this change in the Kelsenian position, insufficient for some and sufficient for others, it is necessary to explain that for Kelsen, the concept of norm does beyond, uh, does, um, does beyond the normative statement issues by the legislator. The juridical norm in the strict sense, is the one that is constructed, constructed from various, um, various statements of the general leg legislator in such a way that if, it ha that if I have before me a statement, an article of law or a decree, for example, with a positive meaning that, re uh, that rewards, allows, authorities or informs, where I know before a complaint norm or in a strict sense. I will be of the, of the judges throughout interpretation, in, interpretation to articulate, say, a statement with others that establishes a negative sanction will, will demonstrate, once again, the discretion ju, uh, judicial. The judge much, much change the positive meaning of a statement to read it from the negative of Punish sense, typical of the juridical norm in the strict sense or independent norms. So if the legislator issues a statement that says that, quote, any citizen has the right, if he meets requirements A and B, to move freely in his vehicle, on his car, or that, quote, the procedure of, for creating a municipal decree is X and Y, the Jews assume that behind, and this is, there is a sanction norm that could be transcribed in a following way. Quote, the citizen who travel with his vehicle or his car without fulfilling their requirements, A and B, must be punished by C. Being C and sanction, a punishment, stipulated in some another normative statement and that the judge considers applicable to the case within the framework of the current system itself to the case that it judges. Or, quote, if the procedure A, X and A is not respected, the municipal decree must be decreted null but I, I need to uh, uh, create later um, this specific example because it's very, very complex. As long as the nullity can be inferred from other normative statements for the system, as is usually the case of these types of example. Thus, every secondary rule of every permissive statement will be the initial premise of a sanctioned norm. But what will a Hartian say about it? In the first place, 
that the distinction between primary rules and secondary rule is not as radical as the critics have claimed to see it, insofar as these categories are not isolated from each other on the one hand, and they are not ontological categories outside the observer, but they are only visible according to the perspective assumed by the juridical operator, by the other hand. In this way, from a certain point of view, point of view, it is possible to see a primary rule of what from another lens, that is from another social practice typical of the internal point of view, will be a secondary rule. Thus, when Kelsen see a primary rule with negative sanction behind a permissive rule of a secondary rule, it does not necessarily contradict heart. Secondly, in the case of secondary rules of change, to follow the previous example of the municipal decree, the nullity is not a negative sanction, since it cannot, quote, be assimilated to a punishment attached to a rule, a rule as an inducement to abstain from the activities which the rules forbids. For example, the referee's decision that a shoot of the balls toward the goal was not a goal is not a punishment to the player, but is part of the rule that establish how, to, how how a score is made. Third, thirdly, that Kelsen still does not demonstrate it, what is required or why is a preferred to find a negative sanction behind a permissive rule or a secondary rule when, it's, when it is also possible to find, for the same case, a positive consequence. For example, that if the procedure is followed with, the municipal decree must be imposed as valid. Well, in this uh, third chapter, uh, I propose another point of view for resolve this debate. Um, I, I resume this third chapter four because uh, we need time for the question. My, my topic or my target is demonstrated that the, the Kelsenian point of view about the structure of the norm obeyed, obeyed to his concept of the Austrian law or the continental civil law and the conception of the heart in, in the saying that not all the rules has a sanction or punishment, obey his concept or, or, con, or the cultural context about the common law, specifically the, the, the English common law. Um, well, in this case, for, for Kelsen, it's very important to demonstrate it that all the, all the norms, all the rules has a punishment, like a juridical consequence, because, his, because for his cultural context, and Hart tried to adequate it to the Kelsenian theories, to the common law, tried to uh, purify, the, purify this theory of the Kelsen, and for this reason, Hart said that that is necessary to, to correct the Kelsian position and to accept that it's possible to meet a rules that don't have punishment like a juridical consequence. Well, in this case, I will go directly to the conclusion of my paper. Well, if, if uh, any any of you like to, to read this paper, I can send to you by email. I, I don't have any problem with that. Well, I read directly the, to the conclusion. The kelsen hart debate on the structure of the juridical norm allows many useful reading for the history of philosophy law and for comparative law. To begin, we need a debate that clarifies their philosophical and where a cultural difference. Hart's central, uh, Hart's central objection is that reducing the norms to prohibited imperatives and sanction punishment produce a distortion 
in what the common participant understands by law, a distortion that allows the uniformity for, of a theory, but that it take her away from reality. Um, no, this is a wrong, excuse me. For Hart, it is a vital to produce a theory that is accepted by the educated citizen who participates in the system. And for this, theory must reflect the richness and variety of norms that live as social practices. Kelsen, Kelsen is more focuses on the currents in his theoretical building, and it is gradual generality, which allow, allow it to be applied to all system and issue that leads him to standardize both the theory of the norm and his conception of the purpose of law. Instead, Hart, in his own general theory, denies that there is a single normative structure and a single function that can explain the law, so that the law has different times or roles and different function depending on the context and according to the social practice to which it is applied. The one we allowed, um, um, apply, the one we allowed to impulse. But this make two points clear. The first, using an expression already known in philosophy of law, Kelsen is a, a I don't know who is said in, in British English, um, Jorge, can you help me, please? Hedy Hawk? I don't, I don't know to, to say this word. Ah, uh, Hedy Hawk, Puerco, Puerco Espin. Hedy Hawk, okay. Hedy Hawk, I say Puerco good? Hedy Hawk. Yeah, okay, thank you Hedgehog. very much. Well, Hart is a fox. The second is that both, so, um, when proposing the general theory, cannot avoid particular elements that determinate their vision, such as their philosophical influence on the one hand and their cultural context on the other. Both aspects determinated this debate on the structure of the standard. Let's see. Kelsen was hard pressure to respond to hard criticisms that went, via, went beyond logical debate. Kelsen avoided referring expressly to the cultural component of the debate that was posed to him. Although I think that, deep down, his theory responding to its philosophical foundation as well as to the continental cultural context. And he avoided such a thing because if he did so, he will have had many theoretical difficulties seen he pressured a descriptive theory of juridical system in general, so that from the outset, the Rainer Rechlere had to reject any type of extrajuridical consideration such as the cultural of the specific juridical system. But Kelsen knew well that this criticism had to be accepted in order to continue affirming that the Rainer Rechlere being formal and general is applicable to common law. For all this, he's proposed a correction, more formal than material for Hart, which in any case improve the presentation of his theory. The norms with positive sanction, despite being recognized as such in various cultures from an internal point of view, they are not full norms seen from the scientific plane. Here, Kelsen will be making a judgment from the Hartian external point of view. But so far, it could be true that this debate is only relevant to the history of philosophy of law. However, these Hartian critics, I repeat, did not see the end. This, this is a very important touch. This is a very important topic. Uh, I repeat, did not see the end of Kelsenian structural means in love, but rather the recognition that the norm is not just a set of prohibited imputation and the general theory of law cannot be reduced to making judgments from the outside of the social practice. This correction will deem it necessary by heart in order to better position the Kelsenian 
in order to better position to the Kirchnerian theories, which he considered in many respects correct and to soften in reference to his soft positivists, a statement that weakened his old very flaw. We can even go to the heart's own words when recording his meeting with Kelsen in Berkeley in 1961. Say Hart, quote, we warned our very large audience that they may be disappointed or bored or both disappointed and bored. For the question we propose to discuss, to discuss, meet excusable appear to them to be dry and technical and our difference to be mere dispute dispute over detail with the positivists cannot jurisprudence or not create interest to those outside it. I explained it that my view was that Kelsen's great work deserved the complement of detailed scrutiny and that is had too often, often been used as an excuse for the debate of vast and vaguely defined issues, such as the Huari perennial know as natural law versus legal positivism. In other words, Hart carried out a detailed scrutiny of the Kelsenian world for its relevance, as well as way to strengthen positivism to prevent said world from being used improperly due to certain very specific aspects, such as the one I show where he about no sanction in the crucial debates on his time. Uh, finally, with this part of, and this become critical, it is remembered that Hart did not hesitate to support Kelsen in the face of common enemies, specifically those that existed without, within the common law. This old work, fictionally speaking, can be seen in dozens of fields. One of them was the criticism of subjective rights, but I would like to draw attention in three aspects. The first one, the purification of a common inspirational source, John Austin, an author that Hart considered essential in order to better semen positivism to the second half of the 20th century. The second one, the combined reaction against, against judicial realms with both sides as the main opponent in the United States. The third, the third one, was the common front in the face of moralistic attacks such as thoughts of Fuller, for we had not clarified the strong separation between morality and law present in the Rainer Reichlere, thus favoring the defense of positivism in the Anglo-Saxon context. It is the more general scheme than the potentially and significance of Hart as a consolidator of the positive in, in his time can be understood. And his work was such that managed in a certain sense with the, his criticism of Kelsen and with their young struggles to give more encouragement to positive means, to give a new air to the discussion that he was um, wagging or heir to perhaps to the Rainer Reich letter no longer had, and that allowed, along with other things, that there were positivists for much longer. Of this is of utmost importance or a contemporary reader like us. But it's also important for the contemporary readers that thanks to thanks to thanks to this debate on sanction in the juridical norm, he enters the realms of juridical anthropology on the one hand and the comparative love on the other signs in the background, the cultural content of the juridical norm associated with its axiological purpose is glimpsed, aspects before which the traditional philosophy of law has fallen short and which are merits, matters that are still valid. Taking up this debate is the before a good way to understand the cultural vicissitudes of the way of conceiving the law in two different models, but which, due to globalization, are now in, in a strong communication. In conclusion, Hart was not the last of the Mohicans who make disappeared things to Dworkin, 
but he is an, still an author who has much to say to anyone who, who wants to be better able to understand philosophy of law and contemporary juridical system, whether a student or expert. Well, I, I finished my paper. Uh, if you like to, to get this paper, to, to get this file, I, I can send to you. I, I don't have any problem with that. Well, I, I think that we continue with the question. Yeah, we have th uh, 13 minutes for questions. Uh, we have the first one from Asia. Uh, Andres, uh, are you there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm here. Okay, I the, the first question come from um, uh, Asia. Asia uh, says, uh, ask, uh, we know a whole number of hard real-time debates, Hart versus Dorkin, Hart versus Fuller, Hart versus Devlin. The one that you mentioned, Hart, uh, Kelton versus Hart, is it a real time debate or do we need to reconstruct such a debate? I, I, I read them the question uh, from, from Asia, uh, Austria. Um, oh, what happened? Um, Pardon me, um, I was reading the, the question. What is the, okay. Um, um, I, I don't know who say about it. Is necessary to reconstruct this debate? In, in I, I don't understand the question because the, the why is necessary to, reco to reconstruct this debate? I, I don't understand the question. Well, I don't think I use the word necessary, or I think I say, do we need to reconstruct such a debate? The, the question is, uh, we know that Hart wrote about Kelsen and expressed his views about Kelsen's theory and criticized Kelsen. Did Kelsen yeah. ever, ever reply to Hart? So was it a real exchange like Hart working, Hart Devlin, Hart Fuller? Or is it you who are reconstructing or us who are reconstructing this debate? So was this one, okay. one way criticism or two way criticism or whatever? Well, I, I understand the question. Thank you very much. Well, my, my, my point is that um, specifically this debate between Kelsen and Hart as um, the importance of, well, of this debate was analyzed by the philosophy of law by a logical point of view. But I think that is wrong because this debate is uh, could be resolved if I can say this debate from the anthropological and comparative point of view. Because Kelsen, um, Kelsen um, um, Say, uh, 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 the point of view of the Kelsen is determinary for his concept of the law of the Austrian law. And the, the concept of the, the structure of the norm of, of Hart is obeyed to the concept of the common law point of view. Well, and I try to demonstrate in my paper that this debate um, was explaining in another point of view, different to the philosophy of love in the 60s and the 70s, tried to demonstrate it, that the Kelsen don't try or don't like to destroy Kelsen. Pardon, excuse me, I, I wrong. Hart don't try to destroy Kelsen, no. Hart tried to purify point of view of Kelsen for to translate the, the Kelsenian theories to the common law because Hart need to Kelsen to confront to the common enemies. For example, the Jewish naturalist, Fuller. Uh, well, Fuller is not Jew naturalist in, in a strict sense, but <laughs> in a strict sense, but, but for to conflict to Fuller, to the juridical realms in the United States, to confront to the, to the traditional um, to the traditional um, uh, uh, traditional positive uh, through in the England, and for this reason, Hart Hart don't like it to destroy Kelsen. The interest of the Hart is only to purify some uh, specifically points of the Kelsen theories for apply 
the Kelsen in the common law. This is my this is my my point. He, and and for this reason, this debate is not a debate. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Jorge, do you, do you have questions, I think? Andres, out of interest, because you, know, uh, you are one of our experts in Latin America, so thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Because for, for the others, um, Andres Botero Bernal, apart from the world, you know, he's very respected in our area in Latin America. And I want you, you know, to ask a question. It is true, it's a fact, I'm not being kind. Um, so don't be modest. But a question to you, Andres, um, you know, if you can share um, with us, you talk about Hart, you talk about Kelsen, you talk about Dworkin and others. And I like your metaphor of Moikans in, in terms of Hart and Hercules uh, in terms of Dworkin. And my question to you, um, what kind of, if there is any, what kind of uh, relevance has had Kelsen and his work in Latin America in particular? And whether you can draw maybe a, a quick comparison, you know, I don't know if I want to say who is more popular, but who has had more influence probably, whether Hart or Kelsen in Latin America? And, and why I'm asking this, not only- In what time, Jorge? Uh, in the in contemporary a, times or in the past? Uh, I would. I mean, up to you how you answer. I would more be inclined, you know, contemporary times. If you want to extend, yeah, my privilege, okay. you know, it's my honor to, to listen. But um, again, it's up to you. Uh, I'm more interested in contemporary times and mainly be, because that will have, uh, most of us are lawyers, even in my case, you know, I have, um, I work in criminal court back in Argentina for 10 years. So I had practical experience as well as a professional. So I know it translates as well, not only at university, but in our highest courts, uh, you know, in Latin America. So that um, that answer, you know, the, the answer to the question I'm asking will have relevance in Latin America, not only at university level, but in our courts, because we lawyers study philosophy of law in Latin America. It doesn't happen in the UK. In the UK, as you may know, uh, philosophy of law is not a mandatory, it's a, an optional, in many cases, uh, unit. And in my school, we don't even teach jurisprudence. Um, so that's why it's, you know, my, my question to you. Because depending on, you know, your answer, it's, you know, what we see at universities in Latin America, and that's what we see as well in the Court of Justice in Latin America. Um, so thank you very much. Eh? Gracias. Well, but you, your question is very strong. I, I don't know who respond this, this question in, in a few minutes, <laughs> because it's, 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 it's very rash and very strong question. Well, um, um, I try to respond to you, but I, I remember to the auditory that is only for the Latin American context, okay? Because, because I know in the Europe and in England is very different. Well, and the Austrian, for example, I, 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 I was in, in Austria to give a lesson uh, 10 years ago, and all the students, to know everything about Kelsen. Um, well, it's obviously, uh, it's obviously Kelsen is an Austrian author, but in Latin America, it's very strange because all the lawyers and the faculties of law all talk about Kelsen, but I think that there are very few professors that read, read seriously to Kelsen. There are so many myths, so many myths about Kelsen, so many myths. And for example, uh, when I was a student in my first years of the Faculty of Law in Colombia, um, uh, I have a, a very good teacher, a very keenly teacher that said to me that Kelsen was a Nazi, a Nazi author. For it. And other professors say to me that Kelsen, um, Kelsen was a positivist, but before to death, he uh, regrets of his theory because he liked to 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 be with peace with God. <laughs> there, there are so many myths about about Kelsen in Latin America, but in this moment, philosophy of law is not important in the faculties of law. Not important. In, and for, in, um, uh, generally, the faculties of law in Latin America, philosophy of law is teaching in um, three or four months, not more. Is teaching very bad. Philosophy is is teaching very very bad. It's very common that professor of philosophy of law in Latin America don't know nothing about philosophy of law. For example, administrative lawyer that the the, the dean dean 
the canon dean dean say hey i need that you teach in philosophy law but dean i don't know philosophy lawyer don't import <laughs> Well, the, the, the level of the philosophy of law in the faculty of law here in America is very bad. And for the same reason, the imagine of the Kelsen in the Latin America is very bad too. And there are so many myths. Well, and and another, another point, in this moment in Latin America is very strong. The, I don't know if you can understand me when I say the neo-constitutionalist theories. Jorge, who is, uh, is, is uh, perfect, this, yeah, uh, perfect. Yes. yeah, in Europe, is the theories in naming in the in the same way neo constitutionalist? No, I not? think that's an Spanish invention. Yeah, but, it's but a we, I've, invention. Seen, I've seen it in bibliography, neo constitutionalism. Uh, for, for example, Robert Alexi, yeah. the uh, well, the, the, <laughs> this theory. What, the, I, I, with the exception uh, of, of Spain and Latin America, I think that the term neo constitutionalism. Doesn't. Okay. 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 But here in, in, in Latin America, specifically in, in countries like Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, these theories, that is very particular theories for our case, is, is, is very strong. And these theories, like neo constitutionalists, that is very near to the Jews naturalists, is very near to the Jews naturalists, is very strong. And for this reason, the concept of the Kelsenian theories in Latin America is, uh, is very bad. It's, it's considered um, uh, many professors, the majority in the faculty of law, consider that Kelsen and Hart is dead, is the last Mohicans. The positivists is in crisis in Latin America and try to, to defend the positivists in, in our faculties. But I try to research about the positivists, but not like philosophy of law. I try to research about this like history of philosophy of law and from the comparative law. Well, I know that your question, Jorge, is very strong for to respond in, in a few minutes, but I try to give you three. Uh, there are three or four areas. Thank you very much, gracias. We have one minute. Someone has a comment or questions? One, <laughs> one minute. <laughs> well, in one minute is impossible to. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much, Andres. And we. Well, I, I write in the chat. In, in the chat, I write to my my email. Maybe maybe anyone to to read my paper, no? Yeah, and one thing I wanted to say, um, uh, neo-constitutionalism, it, it is being used in English, uh, usually, you know, uh, translations from Latin America or a research referred to Latin America, but the term it is being used um, in, in the UK and um, the US, neo-constitutionalism. I'm not sure in German, but in English, it's certainly being used, neo-constitutionalism. Ah, okay. Yeah, it it's is very being important, used. Very important. I mean, it's but being the... used for, for decades now. It's becoming more and more, even feminism is using that term right now, uh, a fourth wave. We, I don't know how many waves they have now, fourth, fourth wave or fifth wave of feminism. So it is being used. Okay. okay. We Thank you very much for this clarification. Thank you very much. I don't know, we are something. Uh, gracias, uh, Andres. Uh, thank you, Gonzalo. We welcome uh, Professor Garbarino. And after Professor Garbarino, uh, Professor Asia Astroke. We have uh, a, we have time till um, se till seven o'clock UK time. Uh, so, but but with with questions. So first we do the the two presentations, and after that we have thirty minutes for the questions. Is it okay? So, Professor Garbanino, oh, you are in the town. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Can you see me? No, by your presentation. <laughs> oh, okay, let me just uh, try to. Uh, 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 okay. Now you should also see me. No, but but it's okay because we have your presentation. In the okay, so I will I will I will do a, like a radio presentation without. <laughs> 
Okay, so you can hear me. Yes. So how much time do I have exactly? You have 30 minutes. What? 30. Oh, 30, I understood. Three minutes. <laughs> Let me just uh, put my timer. Okay. 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 So I'm, I am, uh, thank you for having invited me and I'm really honored to have uh, all around the world a, a committed group of, of legal theorists uh, that have endured a full day. And, uh, and uh, I hope not to, uh, not to annoy you with my presentation. So I, 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 uh, I took the liberty to, to, to change the, the very long title that I had uh, that you have in the program with nomodynamics and the generative, generative grammar of, uh, of law. And I have a, a long set of slides, but I, we can go quickly about these slides. So basically, I mean, there are, there, are, there are very good presentations in this conference, some of them, um, you know, for the, the knowledge of the actual thought of Kels and other discuss uh, the implication of questions in the modern legal uh, theory. So my presentation belongs to this uh, latter category. So I try to, to you, know, you know, on the shoulders of giants, I try to, uh, you know, to expand uh, to Kelsen seminal intuitions. These seminal intuitions, uh, uh, you know, lingered on legal theory, but they were never really fully developed. The first one, is that there are singular rules in the legal system, not only general rules. There is still a debate as far as, far as I know. Some people deny the existence of singular, the existence of singular rules such as uh, decisions by judges or administrative decisions. And the second intuition is, the legal, is that the legal system has a hierarchical and dynamical structure, uh, what we call the number dynamics. So the, the aim of the paper is to explore the implication in light of the recent development of, of social sciences. Kelsen was a, was a man of the last century, died in 1973. And in the last 50 years, there have been amazing development in social sciences, namely cognitive sciences, ne natural science, and uh, you know, uh, generative grammars in linguistics, that these are the developments that I uh, consider uh, here. So, uh, in respect to singular, the, the first type of expansion, uh, I, I claim that there is a class of singular rules. There's a class of rules that also, uh, that rules also include, uh, this is the, the most difficult part, you know, is the most innovative part of my presentation. So you have to bear with me. And we don't have time to have a discussion, uh, a detailed discussion about uh, the ontology of these, uh, personal self-directed rules, uh, but you know, there will be an initial part of the presentation that uh, will introduce that. So yeah, you have to just follow what I say. We don't have time to discuss that because of course there can, there can be a big discussion denying the existence of what I call personal rules. Um, uh, so the idea, the expansion is that uh, uh, non Kelsenian uh, homodynamics can be expanded to include also these personal rules. The second expansion is that uh, it is true. I mean, I use this, you know, trick technique. In blue, you have what Kelsen says, and we all agree. And in blue, in uh, in red, there is the potential expansion of of, of Kelsenian ideas. So um, uh, this hierarchy structure of the, the of the legal system. Uh, constitutes, in my view, can constitute an evolving network. So I will develop a simplified network model of production rules uh, that I call nomodynamic networks uh, that show a normative complexity that is not ca captured by traditional Cassinian nomodynamics. So I have a, basically three sessions, key concepts, then, uh, you know, the expansion of Cassinian nomodynamics, uh, the second and the third will be uh, will be about uh, uh, network normal dynamics. So the key concepts uh, are essentially these. Uh, I have a glossary of key terms. The first one is normative mind. The idea is that the ontic, op uh, the ontic operators, like, you know, uh, must, uh, should, uh, may, occur in the minds of individual and not in the norms per se. Uh, so uh, both legislators, courts, and administrative agencies 
that I will, I will call them agents, but particularly individual citizens, uh, recipients, uh, uh, have in their normative mind is the ontic operators. A mental content is a content that is not just in the rules per se, but in the normative minds of, of those to, this, to whom these rules are addressed. And particularly inten intentionality is what a mental state rep represents and, uh, you know, can be a desire, belief or something else. In our case, the mental reaction, the personal mental reaction to law. So personal rules, uh, as opposed to all the other rules that we all, that we all know, is occur when a specific individual obeys uh, a rule that is externally posed, of course, legally binding, and her action is undertaken with the intentionality with a certain latent content, which is in the normative mind. Uh, uh, so this idea of personal rules is that the rules, in addition of being a social fact, are a mental phenomenon. So they do not exist in vitro or in the semiotic sign that convey them and you know, ontologically per se, but they exist as personal rules also, we can say, as personal rules in the minds of, in, of individuals who follow them. So you know, this is contrasted with an objective ontology of rules, you know, typical common paradigm, if Rex was the power to disobey their subjects, A, B, and C commands them to do C, then A, B, and C are obligated because Rex said so. So it's, it's ontologically separate uh, the norm from the recipients. Here, I don't have time to, to go into details in that. Uh, I, you know, I, I rest on a subjective anthology of rules uh, based on social approach. Uh, the construction of social reality and institutional reality depends on collective intentionality, constitutive rules and, and, and status function. So there are many reasons to, to conclude that the rules are ontologically subjective in certain, uh, you know, sense. Uh, uh, so, you know, the point is, but where are they? Uh, are they true? Do they exist? Uh, yes, they can be described by statements that are epistemi epistemic epistemically objective. As I said, we don't have time to discuss on this. So you have to follow that as an act of faith. Of course, my presentation can stop here if there is a discussion uh, saying that, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, personal rules and a subjective ontology of rules cannot be um, developed. Uh, we know within this context, co co concept of personal rules, uh, uh, of course, uh, there can be uh, both rule obedience, this is a personal rule, but you know, it's important. I mean, if I do not follow a rule, my personal rule is rule disobedience. So it can be, of course, illegal, but it's still a personal rule. Um, just, uh, you know, just for the sake of clarity. So uh, basically, and here I have in blue what we all know, from Kelsen and legal positivism in general, we have primary rules that uh, rules that is generally regular con conduct uh, and are addressed to mul multiple identified uh, recipients and singular rules that are addressed to identified recipients, for example, a judicial or administrative decision. So this uh, here, I have, this is my, my, my terminology. I mean, it's, it, this is not just for the sake of terminology, but because uh, uh, there is a, a basic dual distinction uh, that is reflected by this, uh, you know, dual terminology. So I call nomothesis all the general singular rules that we all know that I have just described, uh, while uh, where an agent addresses a rule to external third parties recipient. Nomonoesis, I changed this uh, after a comment by, by Gonzalo a few months ago, Initially, it was normal po po poiesis, but you know this creates some some confusion with similar words. So, uh, a normal poetic, a normal noetic rule from from noesis mind uh, is the intentional process generating generating normative mental content, and this is a self-directed personal rule. So, normal normal noetic rules are those are those personal rules, and normal noesis is the process of creating them. So the nomothetic rules that we all know are have an inanimate semiotic content, which I mean doesn't detract anything from their you know generally and socially accepted normativity. While the nomonoetic rules, so this is in blue, expand, expanding Kelsen, 
are animate, speci have animate specific normative content because they individualize the inanimate content of nomothetic rules. So the individual addressee takes these, the nomothetic external rules as object of their intentional process, generating normative uh, mental content and as personal rules. Uh, so, just uh, uh, this first personal perspective is uh, rule C, individual meetings requirement X have a duty to do Y, is uh, reflected in the statement of an internal nomothetic rule, individual I, myself, individual A, have a duty to do J, Y, because I meet the requirement X of rule C. So the term I is the first personal structure of the experience and the verb is the type of intentional activity. So there is a non-smoking silence in the room. That is the nomothetic rule. I enter the room and then I refrain from smoking. And that's the nomothetic uh, no, uh, rule. Uh, so there is an individual process in which the individual create normative content. So it is evident to everybody that this, uh, this normative personal content is the result of a social fact, you know, the externally posed norm. So there is no doubt about that. About that. So I'm not de developing an argument to, 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 to deny the, the, the existence or the ontology of, of rules and social facts. I am adding an additional cat category. So um, um, how we identify these personal rules? They are not published like, statutes in the official gazette, clearly. So this is, this is, this is a, 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 you know, an interesting difference, but through a kind of micro phenomenology of the ontic operators, uh, you know, this is a new line of cognitive, micro phenomenology is a new line of cogn cognitive research to show how we can describe our experiences very reliably through appropriate methods. Then uh, you know we can uh, explore the content of the normative personal experience, and nobody can deny that there is this normative personal experience. You know, discussion is different; is is about the reasons why you follow the rules. You know, some you know most people think that we follow the rules reason following a heart because there are content independent reasons. You know, there is a minority of people who think that is not entirely true, but this is another kettle of fish from. Uh, asserting the the, 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 the the personal normative experience of rules. So expanding Cassini and our dynamics is the second is the second session. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, I skip you know the definition uh, the case definition of dynamics because in this group of committed legal theorists, uh, you know, we all know what we are talking about. Generally, when we go to first year law school, we have this pyramid of the of the of the stupid bow, but nothing more than that. So we we'll try to, of course, uh, uh, to go more in detail. So I initially rely on a I clarify a, a stylized model of classical Cassini and novel dynamics with no pretense of going to the details, because uh, I am not an expert of Cassini thought, and so this is just an course uh, for a in. A, you know, in an, in an aspect of case. And so, I mean, of course, uh, this can be further detailed. And then I expand the model to account also for, for the nomonoetic rules that we were discussing. So this is, you know, very simple. is 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 a matrix that we all know, and we have a meta rule, you know, rules, primary rules of conduct, and, 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 and of course, meta rules. And then you have general and singular rules. So you have different types of rules, right? So, um, and this is case in dynamics. So the thermodynamic rule basically, I mean, the, the, the ground norm is behind, and I don't, I do not discuss here the ground norm, of course. So I discuss the living, the living law, the living Cassini law. So the thermodynamic rules attribute normative powers to designate the agent to issue rules of conduct, basically statutes. Uh, and rules of the case, basically, uh, you know, singular rules, uh, judicial decision, administrative decision. Then, of course, you can also account for micro meta rules that are singular rules that change previous singular rules, such as, for example, an administrative act that refers to previous administrative. This is stuff that we all know. So, this new matrix adds in red. Uh, you know, these new animals that are uh, nomonoetic rules that are the genitive, what I call 
just for the sake of common understanding, uh, generative rules and self-apprised rules. Actually, self-apprised rules has been also used by uh, by uh, my friend at NYU who took his legal theory, uh, famous, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name right now. So he has wrote about that, he's cited in, in, in my paper. I will, I will get the name in a sec. So um, let's start from the generative rules. Uh, well, I mean, a generative rule is is a personal rules that uh, apply to myself, to uh, to myself as an agent, uh, a nomodynamic rule. So this is a crucial point. I hope to be clear enough to to, to clarify that. So, uh, of course, here there is a little bit there is a little bit of a trap because uh, usually agents are collective bodies, and of course, collective bodies don't have a mind. But of course, here we can open we could open here a very long discussion about about how collective bodies act in the world, but you know there are people in the collective bodies. So we assume that the, collect, the, the normative mind is the normative mind of the people representing the collective body. But let's assume for the sake of simplicity that it, 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 there is an individual judge. So an individual judge says, I, myself, an individual judge A, I have the power to enact a, for example, a judicial decision, uh, because uh, a basic nomodynamic rule of the legal system attributes to me such power, or could be, you know, the the the, the, the policeman, uh, you know, ma right, making a ticket for for the car uh, which is parked irregularly, right? So, um, and self applied rules are even more uh, important in my view, uh, uh, and it's easier to understand that. There is a statute that says, for example, you have to pay taxes. So uh, I pay my taxes. So I, individual A, I have a duty to pay my taxes because I meet the requirement of the tax statute. And so evidently I go on and I actually pay the tax that I have, I have uh, I do, uh, the due tax. And this is true for all kinds of rules that come from, from, uh, from the general rule, rules of conduct. Uh, so I skip these slides where you know you have the statements, the typical statements. So basically, basically, in an expanded nomodynamics, uh, you know, of course, we know the concept of you know chains of production, production of rules by rules that we have in case and sequences of different rules created by nomodynamics. This process, uh, which is activated by nomodynamic rules, is actualized by agents through generative rules first. And then, uh, for example, if I am a judge, if there is a judge, a judge will uh, self apply the, the general nomodynamic rule about uh, you know, uh, jurisdiction. He will issue a judicial decision, a rule of the case to Mr. Carlo Garbarino, and Mr. Carlo Garbarino will apply these singular rules through a self applied rule. So, here, of course, there can be a huge amount of debate, and somebody will say this is. This doesn't follow the, the Occam razor. Why you add these entities? We are all happy with uh, what we know. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, here then you have this uh, basically, this is again an oversimplification, but you have the uh, implementation of, of, uh, of a statute through a judicial decision that leads to a self applied rule. Then, of course, you have uh, the implementation of a statute directly through a self applied rules. And then you have a variation of these. Uh, sometimes uh, you apply, uh, for example, a traffic regulation is self applied by the individual while driving. Why, for example, taxes are usually paid in a more, uh, in a, with a slightly more complicated normal dynamic process because you have to file a tax return in which you define exactly the amount of your tax obligation. But this is, you know, a detail, basically. So, you know, then we get to the, the, you know, this term that I like to use, you know, which is normative horizon. Yeah, so, Professor, you have 10 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, self the rules are terminal because they do not lead to other rules. And the, the legal system is a very, is a vast number of self-applied rules. While you know the nomothetic rules of the Cassandrian nomodynamics give you the backbones of the system, nomothetic rules give you you know the terminal outcomes. So in a in a in a, in a kind of metaphors, the nomodynamic rules are the backbones, so the rules of conduct, the main as, a, arteries. 
the rule of the case, the smaller arteries, the generative rules, the capillaries, and the self apply rule are the endings. So you have, you know, basically, you know, uh, capsizing uh, uh, the the Stufenbau here on the bottom. Here you have the the growth norm, then you develop up, 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 up until you reach a very, very, a very, a very broad surface or horizon of self-applied rules. These rules uh, do not follow the criteria of validity of nomothetic rules, but uh, uh, simply are uh, the outcome, the determined outcome of, of nomodynamics. So why they are important? Well, I mean, we all know, maybe we are not fully aware, but, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day operation of the legal system uh, do not generally require intervention of institutional authority because we self apply the rules. Then, uh, you know, so there is a spontaneous compli compliance with legislation. Then uh, there is a moral dimension, even when we apply statutes and law, when statutes set criteria or standards such as reasonableness or prudence, then of course we define on a case by case what is this requirement by law. And, uh, and of course, even if, when we follow mandatory law, there is still a strong valuation of individual autonomy or, or dignity, particularly if we do believe that even if we do disapprove of the, of the binding norm, we follow the, the, the norm because of the authority of law. So, so I get to the final part and I have uh, uh, nine minutes less, left, which are enough, which is network normal dynamics and the grammar of law. Um, well, a network, as you know, is a set of uh, items, they are nodes that are uh, connected by links. And a normal dynamic network is a special kind of network in which the nodes are the agents and the recipients and the links and the rules enacted by them. I have a little bit of diagrams here that, uh, easily explicate this concept. This is, you know, this is a general concept of, of a network. Uh, this is like a social network, so a group of friends. So this this guy here will, you know, probably don't have frequent contact with this guy but here, but the, this group are very frequent contacts. These are general structures. So you can have a lattice, a distributed net, but you can, you can have a centralized net. And then, then you can have so many types, in, you know, in infrastructure, for example, decentralized nets, right? So this is very fragile because if you kill here, you destroy the net, these are more robust. And here we have, I, I take this from the legal system from RAS, uh, you know, uh, the Kelsenian normal dynamics as a network, uh, as a network. So here, these are the nodes. So you start the basic norm, then you have the constitution and, you know, uh, constitution, this is the constitutional norm, then you have the statutes. These are the sta statutory norms. These are decisions. There is, there is a final link uh, and, and if you go here, for example, this is a, a, a personal rule. This is an, a, an agent that enacts a, self or a, a, a personal uh, self-applied rule and there is no other node because this is a terminal node of the of this uh, network so uh, basically uh, this is created because there are structural hierarchy between agents that are established by normal dynamic rule so this is a strict co constitutive uh, constraint of the construction of a network you can construct you could construct a legal network by putting together norms that are connected semantically or axiologically, but this, this is completely different. This is a nomodynamic network. And the, the feature of this network is that, uh, I mean, as, as seminally Kelsen said, is a hierarchical structure, top down. So, you know, in uh, network studies and literature, this is technically called a acyclic directed network because there are no cycles of loops, the links go all in one direction and they represent the diachronic evolution of the legal system over time. So one node will be always precedent to the other node. It's impossible that, uh, that uh, uh, you have a different situation. And these are just very simple again, you know. So here you have basically, uh, this is a generative rule and the constitutional legislator then the degenerative rule, uh, you know, uh, the legislator enacts the statute, then possibly the, there is a decision by the court. And here you should have a, you have a final link and this is the terminal link. Um, uh, so basically, 
if you if you if you factor in this uh, this process of creation of self apply rules as terminal no audit you, you see the legal system as a comp it's beyond uh, you know in a way uh, computability to a certain extent i mean we we perceive the structure but of course uh, you know um, um, it's 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 kind of beyond an immediate uh, conception so you see the legal system as a complex structure constituted by legal, by chains of production that generates a vast number of uh, uh, self applied rules is a kind of giant nomodynamic world so th there is a potentially limited array of self applied rules uh, that are distributed in cluster according uh, to the underlying chain of production so the feature that is typical of complex networks is that some agents uh, that are defined as apps, apps create much more self-applied rules than on average each or all the other agents. If you take, for example, a leading case of the US court that lasts for decades of centuries or major uh, regulatory statutes like tax statutes or other statutes that are complied with the, by the, all the population, then of course these agents, these specific agents are a number of, of links, uh, meaning of terminal links, self-applied rules by individual that exceed you know, the, the average link that a normal piece of legislation may have. This is just uh, an example. And this leads me to the final part, maybe the most contentious, con contentious part of my presentation, is that uh, you know, do we have a generative grammar of, of law? The generative grammar in linguistics was famously introduced by Noam Chomsky. That I had the, you know, the, the privilege of personally meeting uh, Professor Chomsky when I was a, 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 a law student. So it is basically a set of uh, rules that can accurately explain which combination of words are able to make a grammatically correct sentence. And Chomsky. Uh, conceive of a deep structure, universal grammar common to all the, 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 uh, uh, the languages. So I make a correspondence between uh, languages and, uh, and law legal system. So there are actually three correspondences, you know, uh, and here I have blue and red to distinguish. So in, in linguistics, in, in generative grammar, an utter sentence is an outcome of a tree of connected uh, branches as opposed to like a spontaneous simple word. There are, there are, you know, below there are rules. And the same is a, a, a personal rules. When I go and I don't know, I follow, for example, a health, uh, you know, obligation just to be, uh, you know, uh, current, current with the recent developments, uh, I do that. I could do that for a moral reason or for a practical reason, but in many cases, in many legal systems, I do that because there is a legal obligation. So it's not out of the blue. It uh, comes from underlying trees. There was a constitutional, government, legislator, administrative agency, judge, whatever. But here and now I am doing that. Yeah. Make make it, I know I have, I have it. I have two minutes. I have two minutes. Uh, it makes a, makes a, a distinction between what is a linguistic competence, so the the, the potential capacity of of a speaker of a <laughs> innumerable number of sentences, and what is the actual performance, so the actual use of a language in this situation. And we have a similar thing because we have a, a potentially limited normativity. And then, of course, each legal system, you know, churns out certain rules because of the underlying processes. And then there is also a concept of acceptability. A sentence is acceptable according to certain dimensions. Um, otherwise, it could be it wouldn't make sense in a given language. And the same is for uh, rules, in particular, personal rules, self-applied rules. They come out from a process that makes sense. And you know, in a sense, they are acceptable because they have a generative validity. So it's an, an additional nuance to the concept of validity that have been so many times mentioned today. Um, so, uh, and I conclude in the last, uh, you know, uh, about fifty seconds. Uh, Neto no, no dynamics, like uh, can be said to be a fledgling uh, generative grammar of law because uh, establishes the criteria, you know, shows the criteria that describes which combination of exercise of normative powers and normative and cognitive acts by agents that receiver make valid nomothetic and then thereafter nomothetic rules. 
And there is a, a distinction within a legal system between the deep structure, it's a myth. I mean, I don't know where exactly is this deep structure, the actual production, production that we all know. Just, 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 uh, just to mention, this idea was entertained by not, not, nobody less than John Rawls in, in 71, more or less the time of Chomsky, uh, you know, uh, ideas about uh, moral philosophy as the moral capacity of combining, you know, potential rules on a case by case basis in, in our, in our, in our uh, daily life. So um, to conclude in the last, uh, Five seconds. I have this my my, <laughs> my my timer. You know, uh, a network normal dynamic could fully explain the normative capacity of a legal system to produce normomoetic normomoetic rules, and this can be compared to this grammatical mess of sense that we have in linguistic. And I am done. And I thank you so much for your attention. And I try to to find how. You can also view me for the discussion and I go back to the Zoom um, window. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Professor Garbarino. Uh, Professor Askud, uh, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. May I ask to, yes, yeah, yes, please. Let me share the screen. You have, you have 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, we have 27 minutes for questions and comments. Okay, let me share the PowerPoint presentation with you. So can you see the presentation? Yes. Right, okay, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. First, I would like to thank Jorge, Gonzalo, and everyone else involved in organizing the round tables and the Congress and for inviting me to participate in both. I'm very grateful for that. So in our group Legal North, I actually represent Legal South, the Commonwealth Caribbean region, and I will be talking about jurisprudence in this particular region, more specifically about our Caribbean legal philosopher Simeon McIntosh and his contribution to the understanding of Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality. I will start with a brief exposition of McIntosh's biography and research interests. Then I will discuss how McIntosh got interested in Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality and why McIntosh believes that this theory should have been applied in deciding the Grenadian case Andy Mitchell and others versus Attorney General and Director of Public Prosecutions. I won't go over the Kelsen theory of revolution and law as Anna has already spoken on that, and most of us are familiar with the theory anyway. I will just discuss how McIntosh applies this theory to Grenada's revolution and why he criticizes it. In my talk, I will also compare Grenadian revolutionary experience with that of other post-colonial British countries that went through revolutionary change of existing legal order and that relied on Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality. And finally, I will speak about McIntosh's contribution to the analysis of the global process of applying Kelsen's theory to revolution revolutionary processes in post-colonial jurisdictions. So who is Simeon McIntosh? Simeon Charles Randolph McIntosh was born in 1944 in the village of Mount Pleasant on the island of Kariakou, Grenada. So he himself is from Grenada, one of the former British West Indian territories. Simeon McIntosh studied at different colleges and universities in the United States and in Canada. Uh, importantly, he studied law at Harvard University School of Law in Washington that was historically an all black university. He also attended Columbia University School of Law from which he received his LLM degree. As for his employment, McIntosh mostly worked for many years as a law professor at his alma mater, Harvard University School of Law, and at the end of his career, he was appointed as a professor at the Faculty of Law at Cave Hill campus of the University of the West Indies in Barbados. Throughout his teaching career, he taught such courses as constitutional law, jurisprudence, constitutional theory, and civil procedure. He passed away in 2013. His colleague Stephen, Stephen Vassiani recalls that McIntosh was joking about going in his afterlife to a heaven in which Hegel, Kelsen, Frankfurt, Dworkin, Hart, and other monarchs of jurisprudence would be arguing about the nature of law at dinner time. His scholarship testifies that he well deserves this. 
Macintosh was a prolific author. He has written numerous books and articles on jurisprudential problems of various fields of law, constitutional law, human rights, criminal law, and land law. So here is just a list of his books, uh, Caribbean Constitutional Reform, Rethinking the West Indian Polity, Fundamental Rights and Democratic Governments, Governance, Essays in Caribbean Jurisprudence, and Reading Text and Polity, Hermeneutics and Constitutional Theory. Those are just books and he has numerous articles as well. In his writings, Macintosh engaged into jurisprudential debates with all the most famous European and North American philosophers of the 19th and the 20th century, Austin, Hegel, Finis, Hart, Rawls, and Kelsen. Uh, for example, his article, The Chattel House is Reading in Hegelian Jurisprudence, is an attempt to apply Hegelian philosophy of property to the law of real property in the Commonwealth Caribbean. I actually have published an article on his contribution to the solution of the chattel house problem. It is available online if you are interested. His other article, Controversial Propositions of Law and the Positivist Embarrassment, the hard working debate reconsidered, is his own contribution to the famous hard working debate. It goes without saying that Macintosh is the most famous philosopher in the Commonwealth Caribbean. His scholarship has exercised significant influence in the field of constitutional law and constitutional theory, as well as human rights in the region. This scholar is well known for his analysis of acute legal problems of the West Indian society against the background of European and North American legal philosophy. To put it briefly, Macintosh conceptualized burning social problems of the region and put them into jurisprudential context in order to provide possible solutions to these issues. One of Macintosh's interests was the Grenada's revolution, as well as legality and legitimacy of the governments that controlled the country in its aftermath. The subject matter is thoroughly studied in a number of his articles, Legitimacy, Validity, and the Doctrine of Necessity, the case of Andy Mitchell and others reconsidered, Continuity and Discontinuity of Law, a reply to John Finnis, Kelsen and the Grenada Court, Revolutionary Legality Revisited, and in the case of Yasin Abubak and others, a dissenting view. These four articles were later published in one single book that was entitled Kelsen and the Grenada Court, Essays of Revolutionary Legality. It is the title of this book that is incorporated into the title of my today's presentation. I picked it up as it summarizes nicely Macintosh's vision of Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality and the way it can be used to assess the events of Grenadian Revolution. Today, I will be speaking mostly about Macintosh's critical examination of 1986 Grenadian case, Andy Mitchell and others versus Attorney General and Director of Public Prosecutions. So let me outline the major events of Grenada's revolution. So this is just a map for you to see where Grenada is located. It is a small island in the Commonwealth Caribbean close to South America. So in 1974, Grenada became independent from the United Kingdom and adopted an independence constitution and established a new system of government. In March uh, 1979, the constitutionally elected government was overthrown in a coup d'etat and was supplanted by the People's Revolutionary Government. The new government suspended the official constitution and issued in its place a series of proclamations until the time a new constitution would be promulgated. It also disbanded the Grenada Supreme Court and replaced it with a new High Court and Court of Appeal for Grenada. This revolutionary government remained in power until October 1983, when as a result of an internal palace coup, the prime minister and several other ministers were killed. Later the same year, United States Armed Forces intervened and the leaders of the palace coup were arrested. The American intervention enabled the Governor General of Grenada to assume power. In early 1984, the independence constitution was reinstated, but without the provisions on the court system. The Governor General issued a proclamation that effectively retained the court system established by the People's Revolutionary Government. The arrested leaders of the internal palace coup 
were charged with murder of the prime minister and other ministers of the People's Revolutionary Government and were later tried in the High Court of Grenada. The accused challenged constitutionality of the High Court since it had been established by anti-constitutional revolutionary government. The accused also claimed that the governor general lacked any authority under the independence constitution to retain such an illegal and unconstitutional court. They believed that the only court that could legally try them was the high court that was in place in Grenada before the coup d'etat of March 1979. The motion was denied. The accused appealed to the Grenada Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal decided that the People's Revolutionary Government was indeed an illegal unconstitutional government, and the courts established by that government were unconstitutional. However, the court ruled that because the pre-revolutionary court was no longer in place in Grenada in the aftermath of the revolution, it was a matter of public necessity that the People's Revolutionary Government should have instituted its own system of courts. So the, the court relied on the doctrine of necessity. The court also concluded that the governor general equally lacked the legislative authority under the independence constitution to retain the courts of the revolutionary government. However, the court decided that the governor general acted in the best interests of Grenada at a time of crisis and found the court's decision to retain the courts of the People's Revolutionary Government temporarily valid under the doctrine of the state necessity. So the High Court had jurisdiction to try the accused. This is the holding of the Court of Appeal in a nutshell. McIntosh, while upholding the decision of the court, criticizes its arguments and believes that Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality provides a better support for, uh, to the decision. This case, according to McIntosh, addressed the question of legitimacy of three consequent uh, administrations. First, the People's Revolutionary Government that was established in Grenada after a successful revolution in 1979, then the government established as a result of an internal palace coup. And finally, the government established in the aftermath of the American invasion in 1983, so-called the governor general's regime. While addressing himself the issue of whether the People's Revolutionary Government was a legitimate government, McIntosh follows Kelsen's distinction between legitimacy and legality, validity of a political regime. McIntosh believes that legitimacy is a broader concept and entails legality, validity. Uh, legitimacy deals with the question of the justness of the state or of the legal order as a whole, while validity applies more to particular laws, whether they have been enacted in a manner prescribed by the basic law of the state or not. A common weakness of the court's opinion, according to McIntosh, is that it failed to recognize the distinction between legitimacy and validity legality. And when judges address the question of the de jure status of the People's Revolutionary Government, they were indeed addressing the question of the legitimacy of the state formulated in the language of legal validity. However, for McIntosh, the question of the legitimacy of the state is primarily what he calls a moral, political, and not legal issue. It is a question about the justificatory reasons why a citizen must and should obey the state. A court never has jurisdiction or competence to decide this sort of question. When a court, as an agency of the state, addresses such a question, it sits more as a justificatory and not adjudicatory body. The court explains the parties why the state is legitimate and why its laws should be followed. The judges are also justifying their acceptance of the obligation to apply and enforce laws of such a state. But no court could have the authority to sit and determine whether the state it serves an agent is legitimate. The courts are agents of the new state. They lack the power to determine the validity of the state since the state cannot derive its validity from its own agents. So McIntosh reveals circular reasoning of the court. The court represents the state and at the same time, uh, the court decides whether the state is valid or not. 
For Macintosh, the question of legality of a revolutionary state is a question of its legitimacy. There is no question of legality for him because revolutionary state is already an illegal regime. And the very expression revolutionary legality for Macintosh is a serious contradiction in terms as the revolution is by definition an illegal act. So the question is rather what makes a state a political regime or legal order legitimate, or putting it differently, what makes it worthy of loyalty and obedience? As we have seen, Kelsen's legal theory would consider any effective regime as legal system and by implication as a legitimate one. So uh, in English, it is summarized in the phrase might is right. Thus, legitimacy is linked primarily to effectiveness, and Kelsen's theory leaves open the question of the difference between law and naked force. So Macintosh believes that Kelsen's theory of legitimacy remains inadequate and incomplete, as it is not concerned with the question of what would make meaningful the obligation of fidelity to law. However, according to Macintosh, Kelsen's theory does offer some advantage because if the new regime has successfully established itself, judges cannot rule that it is invalid because it did not come to power in accordance with the constitution. The courts must face up the reality and acknowledge the new source of their authority to decide cases. And uh, this uh, is the moment or the place in Macintosh's reasoning where he goes beyond Kelsen's theory and makes an important contribution. He adds to Kelsen's criterion of legitimacy, a criterion of justification. Macintosh himself thinks that the people's revolutionary regime was legitimate, not just because it was efficient, but because it was morally justified. Macintosh's understanding of law follows that of St. Thomas Aquinas, who defined law as an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has the care of the community. Macintosh says that it cannot be denied that the people's revolutionary government claimed as its principal objective the eradication of injustices and the reduction of class struggle. The People's Revolutionary Government proposed its own model of distributive justice. It was clearly illegal, but it was a legitimate government. So Macintosh adds to Kelsen's theory of efficiency, the notion of moral justification to legitimize the People's Revolutionary Government. Then Macintosh addresses the issue of the general governor assuming the power after American intervention in 1983. Macintosh does not agree with the court that the governor general acts were unconstitutional. The governor general did not assume power in 1983 as governor general under the pre-independence constitutional order, but rather as a governor general of the new state. Even if his acts were unconstitutional, they were unconstitutional in terms of the people's revolutionary state he served as a head. In 1983, Governor General acted in his own name, not in the name of the independence regime that no longer existed. He was a de facto new legal regime, new legal order. And here we face the same question as with people's revolutionary government, whether his regime was legitimate and whether the governor general acted for the common good and general welfare of the people of Grenada. Macintosh answers yes to these questions. The governor general gave Grenada a new constitution in 1983, constitution in quotation marks, meaning a new fundamental law of the state, a new green norm to use Kilzanian terms. So the governor general's authority to reinstate the pre-independence constitution was independent of that constitution and neither contrary nor in accordance with it. The same applies to the preservation of the court system. It was not done in accordance or in contradiction with any enactment of the previous regime, but in governor general's own right under his new constitution. So it is the mistake of the judges that they saw the question of the status of the governor general's administration as a constitutional issue. The view that it was a constitutional issue can only rest on a presumption of constitutional continuity of all the governments in question, which was not the case. 
McIntosh also criticizes that court qualifying the governor general's actions as unconstitutional reasons that those actions could still be validated under the doctrine of necessity. The doctrine of necessity argues that in the situation of an emergency, the state is justified in taking such actions as required by the situation, even if those actions are unconstitutional. And the courts taking into account the emergency and the good for which the state was acted will excuse the unconstitutionality of these actions and treat them if, as if they were valid as long as it was required. The application of this doctrine, according to McIntosh, primarily applies to the actions of the constitutional state whose validity is already a settled issue where such actions, though unconstitutional, might still be said to have been within the legal system. The justices of the Grenada High Court misconstrued the doctrine when they applied it to validate the acts of the People's Revolutionary Government to establish their court system and of the governor general in retaining it. Questions regarding the application of the doctrine of the state necessity may arise only where a valid constitutional norm has been violated and the court seeks for a moral justification for such action. But it would be meaningless to say that the actions of the People's Revolutionary Government were unconstitutional or the Governor General's actions were unconstitutional because each of them established their new legal regime. So the doctrine of necessity would not apply here. But McIntosh also argued that it was absolutely necessary to retain the High Court of the People's Revolutionary Government for the specific purpose of trying that specific case. The accused committed a crime in violation of the laws of that regime, uh, and it is the court of that regime that has the competence to hear precisely this sort of case. So McIntosh is convinced that the court's decision is wrong, so let me summarize. So first, the court has no jurisdiction to decide whether any of the three regimes had the power to create it. The court's absurdity and circulate, uh, circularity is evident. The very fact that the court sits and decides such questions and expects its decision to be valid and binding confirms its validity as only a valid court could run, render a valid judgment. So then the regime is valid as well. Second, both the uh, People's Revolutionary Government and the Governor General created efficient and legitimate legal systems within which they operated. There was no continuity of the legal regimes. So, and this is why the court did have competence to try the accused uh, as it was the only court in force when they committed their crime. So while analyzing this case, McIntosh applies the best part of Kelsen theory of revolutionary legality, the test of effectiveness, and adds to it a moral criterion, Aquinas' understanding of law and application of this understanding to the people's revolutionary government and the governor general's legal regime, and justifies the jurisdiction of the High Court of Grenada to try this case. Now, well, we can say that that's an interesting topic for the Caribbean, but does it have any global, any international implications? Well, it actually does. It's very interesting that in the 20th century, Kelsen's theory has been used to justify emergence of new legal regimes by means not authorized by constitutions in force in those jurisdictions at the time. And the courts had to decide on validity of these legal regimes by discussing the validity of those uh, legal orders and by applying either the doctrine of necessity or Kelsen theory. And this happened in many, many times in former British colonies. There were two competing theories that could be used to justify the new legal regime. So the first is the doctrine of necessity that has been known to the common law tradition long before Kelsen. And it was widely applied, for example, by the United States courts in the aftermath of the Civil War to decide the question of validity of confederation laws, for example. And the second theory that is more recent, Kelsen's theory, that was also used to legitimize new regimes. 
I will just give example of both uh, doctrines. So the first case is Mazimba Muta versus Ladna Berg. So this is a case from Southern Rhodesia that is now known as Zimbabwe. That was a British colony governed by a constitution. The UK parliament retained the power to legislate for the colony, including the power to amend the constitution. The majority of the colony were black Africans, but the government was dominated by minority whites led by the prime minister, one Ian Smith. Britain was planning to grant the colony independence under the constitution that would have led to black majority rule. However, in November 1965, Smith and his cabinet proclaimed a unilateral declaration of independence, stating that Southern Rhodesia was no longer a crown colony, but was an independent state. The governor, Queen's representative in the colony, issued a public statement that the declaration of independence was unconstitutional, and the UK parliament passed the Southern Rhodesia Act of 1965, which reaffirmed UK sovereignty, nullified the enactments of the rebel regime, and suspended the power of the Legislative Assembly. The uh, rebel regime disregarded the Southern Rhodesia Act and established themselves as the de facto government. In Matimba Muta case, the plaintiff challenged the validity of the laws of the rebel regime, under which he was arrested and detained. The High Court of Southern Rhodesia agreed that the Declaration of Independence was unlawful, but that it was necessary for the court to give effect to emergency regulations of the rebel regime because it was the only efficient government in the colony. So the argument of the court was based on the doctrine of necessity. Mazimba Muto appealed to the Privy Council. The majority of the judges firmly rejected the High Court's reasoning and allowed the appeal. They held that the practical difficulties did not absolve the court from upholding valid law. So the ruling says Her Majesty's judges have been put in an extremely difficult position, but the fact that the judges, among others, have been put in a very difficult position cannot disregard uh, or cannot justify disregard of legislation passed or authorized by the United Kingdom Parliament by the introduction of a doctrine of necessity. It is for Parliament and Parliament alone to determine whether the maintenance of the law and order would justify giving effect to laws made by the usurping government to such extent as may be necessary for that purpose. So this opinion, when put in Kelsenian terms, holds that the ground norm of the country did not change and the rules of the legal system derived their validity from the basic rule of the old constitution. The old constitution did not authorize the court to decide the question of validity of the legal rules of the rebel regime. So in this case, with the support of international community, the UK instigated a range of measures to reverse the revolution and succeeded in restoring the new legal regime and retaining the old norm. However, we also have some countries where the new legal regime was successfully established and the court was asked to decide on its validity. And uh, those courts already use Kelsen theory. For example, in Pakistan in 1958, the president after a coup d'etat abrogated the country's constitution and assumed the supreme power. There was no effective political resistance to the move. When the legality of his actions was questioned, the chief justice of Pakistan declared that by abrogating the constitution, the president created a new legal order. The ruling reads, it sometimes happens, however, that the constitution and the national legal order under it is disrupted by an abrupt political change, not within the contemplation of the constitution. Any such change is called a revolution, and its legal effect is not only the destruction of the existing constitution, but also the validity of the national legal order. Very similar to Pakistan, in 1966, the Prime Minister of Uganda, in complete disregard of the country's constitution, assumed all power and promulgated a new constitution. Again, there was no political opposition to his actions. And again, the Chief Justice declared that our deliberate and considered view is that 1966 constitution is a legally valid constitution and the supreme law of Uganda, and that the 1966 constitution having been abolished as a result of a victorious revolution in law, 
and it does no longer exist, nor does it now form the part of the laws of Uganda, it having been deprived of its de facto and the jury validity. In Kelsenian terms, the Supreme Courts of Pakistan and Uganda regarded the revolution in, and the absence of resistance to them as evidence of emergence of a new basic rule and of a new legal order. And there are many more, yes, uh, three minutes, okay. Uh, there are many more cases from post-colonial countries that use Kelsenian terminology and arguments. Basically, all of them apply simply Kelsen's test of effectiveness. If the new legal order is successful, then it is a valid, a legitimate legal order. So because of this readiness to qual qualify any legal regime as a valid one, one scholar who studies all those cases, Tayyab Mahmoud, labeled this approach as jurisprudence of successful treason. And it is indeed a great socio-legal jurisprudential problem that in a number of post-colonial jurisdictions, courts have recognized as valid new political regimes and their legal systems based on mere efficiency. I believe that McIntosh's contribution perfectly addresses this issue. First, uh, very helpful is his detection of circularity in court's reasoning that the court could not decide whether a new political regime is valid or not because the court serves as an agent of this very regime and cannot validate itself. The court expects that its decision is valid and binding, which implies that the political regime that the court represents is also binding. So courts have no right to validate the new legal regime. Second, McIntosh rejects effectiveness as the only ground for validation of a legal regime. He adds to this effectiveness uh, the test of moral justification, something that was missing in other cases. Uh, um, in uh, third, McIntosh rejects the doctrine of necessity used in some decisions, such as in Southern Rhodesia and Grenada, and bases his reasoning on Kelsen's theory while recognizing its limitations. So McIntosh emphasizes the fact of discontinuity between the consequent legal regimes and insists that the doctrine of necessity wouldn't work in this uh, context. The final question that sorry, that I address in my paper is, belongs more to comparative law rather than to jurisprudence. My question resonates with Professor um, uh, Batero's talk, adaptation of Kelsen's theory of law to the common law tradition. My question is, how did it happen that the arguments of a civil law theorist could gain such a success as legal authority in common law courts? And when I call Kelsen a theorist, I mean that he was a theorist and that his theory was highly abstract and theoretical. And I don't think he had ever expected that it would get such practical significance it did. Also, even though Kelsen probably believed that his theory was universal, actually his hierarchy of legal rules with the green norm at the top of the pyramid and judicial decisions closer to the bottom is very civilian. I don't think that Kelsen would ever charge the courts with the task of validating the whole legal system in the aftermath of a revolution. Nonetheless, the courts in common law countries took the role of the legislator in legitimizing new political regimes, something that Kelsen's original theory probably wouldn't admit. This love for Kelsen is especially strange given the availability ability of Hart's theory of validity of a legal system and his own theory of rules. Well, and again, one plaus only plausible explanation why Kelsen's theory became an authority in common law courts is simply that there was no other available authority given that revolutionary acts, as McIntosh says, are illegal by default. But this is something that I would like to investigate in more detail in the forthcoming paper Hope that will hopefully be published. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions or to receive your feedback. Thank you very much, Professor Stout and Professor Garbarino. There are uh, questions or comments? Nobody? Uh, I can see something in the chat box, no? I, I have questions and comments. Uh, do, do you want to, to start, um, Gonzalo, or do you want me to? To break the ice. If you if you want to break the ice, or or, or I can break the ice if you. I don't mind. I'm going to. I'm intrigued because um, Asia is in Barbados. Uh, I'm, I mean, both. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Carlo and uh, Asia. So I have questions for both, but I'm going to start the other way around with uh, Asia, and I changed the picture with with Kelsen behind. 
because similar to what I was asking um, Botero Bernal, you know, Latin America is usually and the Caribbean now, it's usually not uh, or often not uh, very well taken into the global context, you know, for whatever reason. So thank you, Asia, for giving us the opportunity to learn, you know, about uh, Barbados and the jurisdiction. Um, and it's not a surprise for, to me because again, we've been with Asia for a few months. But if you can explain a bit more, because I find it very interesting how Kelsen legal theory, it's been applied in law. So it's been used in adjudication. It's not just a theoretical device, but it's actually a device that practitioners are using. Is it still current? Is it only this particular case? Or what is the actual relevance? Again, if you if you have the time to explain as well university, I'm not familiar with the universities in Barbados, but I'm more intrigued about the practitioner side. Well, uh, again, in this specific case, the court rejected Kelsen's reasoning and relied more on the doctrine of necessity, as I have already said. And it is McIntosh who says that the doctrine of necessity wouldn't apply, but the Kelsen theory would be of better application. So there was another case about an, an aborted coup d'etat in Trinidad in 1990s. But again, because it was aborted, so there was no need to apply Kelsen theory or the doctrine of necessity. They were simply tried for high treason and that was not a big issue. So after that, we haven't had uh, uh, what Kelsen would call a revolution in law. So the constitutional development is more or less uh, stable. So there is no, no need, at least in the Caribbean, to apply Kelsen theory. With respect to other former British colonies, I think it also uh, was uh, instrumental when there was this post-colonial development and changes of legal regimes. So now I would, I'm not a big specialist, but I would believe that those orders and regimes are more stable and again, pr probably no practical reason to use Kelsen as an authority anymore. Thank you for your question. There is someone else who wants to intervene or, or may I, <laughs> I think that, I have, I have two questions. The, the first one is for Professor Garbarino. I have first to apologize because last time we have problems with the sound and perhaps I misinterpreted everything of your, of your paper. Now it's very clear uh, or, or, or clearer than, than, than before. The, the question is, uh, you talk about, as, as, as far as I understood, you, you talk about the uh, uh, particular rules in the in 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 the Kelsenian theory or how to understand particle uh, to uh, rules in this context of Kelsenian theory so the, the the question is which mechanism we have uh, in order to derive these particular to, uh, rules from the general rules because I, I didn't see that in your in your paper and yeah. the Question, sorry, and the second question is for 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 Professor Astruk, uh, is about the, the doctrine of necessity. Uh, the doctrine of necessity needs this Kelsenian uh, fundamentation, this Kelsenian justification, or is possible to justify this doctrine um, uh, based on other uh, positivist theories like Hart or and So thank you. Okay, I start first. Okay, Gonzalo, thank you for your question. Yes, well, generally speaking, I mean, in uh, in uh, in uh, in nomodynamics, uh, a, a nomothetic rule is created by a, a pro an appropriately empowered agent because of a norm of competence, a, a meta rule that attributes the power. Then we generally don't care about what happens in the mind of the for example, individual judge, and then the judge enacts, enacts following the proper procedures, the judgment, right? That is then notified to the, to, to the parties and they, they have to comply. And we don't care about what the party actually do normatively in their mind. And that's the answer to how do you produce in normal Kelsenian dynamics. Then I assume that your question is how do you produce in, in your expansion? 
Well, I mean, the production is properly cognitive. So it's easy, it's, it's easier to understand what I call the self-applied rule with a statute, for example. Mm -hmm. There is a statute uh, or there is this non-smoking sign in you know, the waiting room of the, of the train station. I enter and I see the smoking sign, the semiotic sign, and then I tell myself, ah, I would die smoking a cigarette, but I refrain from doing that because there is a legal rule. Then, you know, and, an, and, and then I produce it as a cognitive, uh, you know, mentation, as a, as a cognitive uh, uh, activity. Then, of course, the discussion of why I, I actually do that uh, is a different uh, kettle of fish. You know, the reasons, it could be because I always follow the law. Be it could be because I am just, uh, you know, I just dumbly follow the law. It could be because, uh, uh, you know, I'm very afraid of sanctions or it could be because I have a higher moral rule that tells me that I don't want to damage the other people or it can be a practical rule because uh, whatever. So I don't care in, in this context uh, and in answering, in answering your question about the reasons, uh, but it's the, the actual, the, the sheer act of uh, creation of the, of the ontic operator uh, mentally uh, to answer your question. Question. I hope that I, have I, I, I ask you that because I'm very uh, um, uh, close to the to Alexis theory, and oh. in Alexis theory we have oh, some you know that. <laughs> we have some assumption. You know, we have this assumption as a mechanism in order to uh, derive uh, particular rules from general rules. Yes, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, although my knowledge, it would require a, a thorough reanalysis of, of the literature, but most most authors, you know, briefly touch upon that. It can be a subsumption by Alexis, that you know, the internal view by 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 Hart, Kelsen had something like that, like the subjective position or something like that. So I, I mean, in a way, is so obvious is so obvious that there is a mental factor in normativity that uh, for many reasons, legal theorists always obliterated that, right? right? So my point is you know, to, to reiterate the attention on such an obvious aspect in terms of legal theory. That's it, nothing, no, nothing particularly and particularly excitingly new because we all know that, but we never emphasize that, I think that's the point of my of my of my of my presentation i have written about that in other context uh, so you know that's that's the idea thank you very much okay uh, let me restate your question so that i can see that i get it right so are you asking that uh, okay whether the doctrine of necessity needs some kind of positivist background some kind of positivist foundation is that correct Yes, I, I, I understood that um, according to Macintosh, the justification of, of the disease, of the decision was a Kelsenian justification of the doctrine. So I I, I was wondering is if it's possible to derive the same uh, position that applying other kind of theories. Uh uh, well, I don't think that's what Macintosh says. He is against the application of the doctrine of necessity. He says the doctrine of necessity can only operate within one single and the same legal system. So when an authorized agent of the state acts unconstitutionally, but we still recognize the validity of their act within the framework of the same legal system. And he says, because there is no continuity between legal regimes in Grenada, the doctrine of necessity should not apply. Instead, we must apply Kelsen's theory. And with, with yeah, and with respect uh, to the connection between necessity and legal positivism, the doctrine of necessity goes beyond positivism because when they speak about necessity, they use some categories that transgress the positive law of the country. So in Grenadian case, they said the governor general acted in the best interests of the citizens of Grenada at the time of crisis. So that. That's not quite positivistic or maybe soft positivistic, but not strict positivistic, at best utilitarian. And same with US courts. They would say, we don't want to harm uh, innocent citizens who gave birth or uh, transferred property in Confederate states. So would recognize those legal acts as
as valid. So that actually is what the doctrine of necessity transgresses the boundaries of positive law and of the positivist theory. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you very much. So I, I misunderstood it again. <laughs> Sorry. No, never mind. So we can discuss it further. Uh, okay. uh, Jorge? You know, I'm, more, I, I'm still intrigued with that, you know, a Macintosh necessity, because I had the same understanding, uh, probably that's the confusion, and I would have to, you know, to read Macintosh here, necessity, and because now that you explain a bit uh, further, you know, the, this um, uh, common interest, or I have to agree with you, the best I can think would be inclusive positivism, which wouldn't be called. And so I, now I understand where, where you are coming from. So if you can give me a bit more um, about here, Macintosh, and a necessity, if you don't mind. Again, out of ignorance, I'm, I'm, I'm asking here, uh, because I'm, I'm intrigued about, you know, I, 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 to me, it was interesting when you mentioned maybe inclusive positivism that wouldn't be killed. And so I, I, I cannot see where you're coming from. Okay, so, well, because Macintosh dislikes the, uh, the um, theory of necessity, the doctrine of necessity, he doesn't pay too much attention to it, maybe a couple of pages, yes, and he says, for the doctrine of necessity to be applied, we need one single legal system. So something, an individual rule should violate the constitution of that legal system or someone's action or what's not, but we will validate it regardless of it's being unconstitutional uh, based on the idea of necessity. So we need to validate it for a particular reason. But if you have subsequent legal regimes, each of them establishes its own grim norm and legal order, there is no matter of necessity because whoever establishes a new regime can validate whatever they want from the past legal regime. So they would just take this as elements of the chain and just connect it to the new chain link and, and that's it. So every new legal regime is, is entitled to keep whatever they want from the previous legal regime. So if the People's Revolutionary Government wants to institute their own courts, fine. If the governor general decides to retain those courts, fine. But this is not validated by necessity, but validated by the whole new legal system, which is efficient. And this helps to distinguish that from the US practice because the Confederate government failed and we are still within the same legal system. And those rules that were promulgated under the Confederate government, so they were unconstitutional with respect to the American constitution. But that generates a plethora of questions. It's still not convincing and we can still discuss that. And uh, again, he made his effort, he made his attempt and uh, well, at least it des deserves some further examination. And I don't know if we have, but very quickly to um, Carl, if you don't mind, Gonzalo. Do it. Yeah, uh, Carl, um, again, to, to me, and I'm going to kind of translate in my own understanding, you know, your um, kind of um, division in terms of capillars, as you call them, you know, this normal dynamics. To me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding, you were talking from top to bottom, from let's say a national constitution to the cases, when you have these kind of branches, you know, or capillars. But my question back to you, and I'm going to go back to Thomas's uh, presentation with luck, um, in the round tables and today, he talks about web, and I have to agree. So my, 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 I'm trying to relate, you know, this top down view you had, can I apply the same methodology? And I guess, yes, I can. That's when I see not a pyramid, but a web bottom up, which I mean, not only national yes. uh, state, not only micro level, but macro level. So in that sense, I could apply your kind of normal dynamics, states with other states, states with international law, international law, national law, and universal law. So I can still apply Kelsenian understanding using your normal dynamics, but not only in the, what I mean micro, you know, your national state kind of scheme to the international level. Am I yeah. on, the, on the same page? Well, I mean, uh, by necessity, my analysis, of course, assumes uh, a, a separate uh, domestic legal system as ever, okay? Then, of course, when we shift from, uh, you know, our uh, cozy domestic uh, scenario to the international scenario, then we face the problem that they were discussed in the previous uh, session, right? So, um, uh, yes, 
I mean, in theory, you could have a bottom up where instead of, uh, but this I'm, I'm thinking aloud, where instead of, uh, instead of uh, let's say a constitution, you have uh, what kind of, uh, of unitary coherent normative content arising from a state determination. Then, then you know, goes into you know the international scenario. But frankly speaking, I never thought of the of that extension. Uh, I mean, I thought of that extension, but I do think that uh, uh, I mean the interdependency of legal system. I see it much more, as I said before, in a in in a kind of uh, global context. So you know, it's. Uh, I have studied at Yale uh, uh, with, uh, you know, under the Yale uh, law international school. So the main issue is the interdependency between international law and municipal law. So that, that's to me, you know, the challenge rather than, and of course, if you want to formalize that at international level rather than a tree network, you have to think too about a, a cyclic network. Huh? So like a social network where states are the nodes and the links are whatever meaningful connection you can establish within them. For example, you can make a network of treaties, assuming that, for example, you have a bilateral treaties, then you have links, bilateral links between nodes. And then of course you have a lattice because many, many nodes, uh, you know, that are not possibly directly connected then become indirectly connected, things like that. There is literature in that, but it's a different uh, architecture of constructing a network. Because when you construct a network, the network is not in 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 in, rapes, uh, in the reality. You select uh, the nodes, and then you select the relationship between the nodes, and then you have your kind of network. That is a map. It's a human creation that is not isomorphic to the reality, of course. So, you know, this is what people in network science do all the time. Or if you take, for example, social network theory, that is something that we don't do, but they invent all kinds of networks of relations between people and groups and explain things based on these kind of networks, for example. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a tool that you can, you can use. And of course you can conceive. I don't think that there is a bottom up three network in international law. Uh, you can conceive of a bottom up of a three network international law if you take the monist approach, the global approach that we were discussing before. So you see the ground norm, and then of course the development of the law bottom up, or if you like top down, as an integrated global monist system. Then, then I mean, uh, this is the the outcome. I think, in the sense of the relations of the previous sessions. Thank you very much. And again, it was like a, 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 an epistemological question rather than ontological. So I get what you what you mean by yes, an assumption. Thank you very much. Gracias, Gonzalo. And thank you, Asia. No, thank you, Jorge. I think that we don't we don't have any any more comments or, or questions. You we, you can you can make the the follow up words if you want. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Well, a, a pleasure to have you all. Um, we've been a bit strict with Gonzalo uh, because we are conscious, you know, we, we have three vlogs, very interesting papers, and we'll follow up with a publication. Most of us uh, are planning a publication uh, with hard publishing uh, the book proposal for the ones that are attending. Uh, thank you in particular, um, of course, to the keynote for being here and in particular uh, to the authors, because they've been with us, I can see right now Asia and um, Carlo, they've been with us since probably January this year, because we opened the call for papers back in December last year, I think, Gonzalo, uh, and we've been all working consistently. Uh, I mean, people tend to see, like I say, with jury not my face, but be be behind my face, jury not, we are eight people, one at the, at the different institutions. And this particular um, Congress and event well, thanks to Gonzalo in Germany and Jorge in Toronto. So it takes a lot of people to, 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 to play, you know, th this show. So thank you very much. And the idea, what we try to do with Gonzalo and Jorge is to bring a platform in which we don't have only US or UK visions, which are not, I'm not claiming they are right or wrong. And what we are trying to show is they are not the only views. Uh, and Kelsen gave us the right tool, I think, for all of us. Uh, it gives us a common language to start. And if this works, maybe in the future we can plan something else. 
again, something more really inclusive, you know, to, to, to bring a, an open platform, uh, not only for UK or the US, but actually for, for people in, in Italy, in Barbados, in China, in Australia, and so on. Um, it's been a pleasure, and we'll continue tomorrow uh, with Lars Binks, um, Cambridge University. Um, pleasure to you all. Uh, you know, thank you very much for coming here and for the attendees, because I can see Sam uh, that have been with us. I can see Adil here. He's been with us all uh, the show. So thank you very much, uh, all of you. I don't know if anyone, before we go, and Phil as well, I can see Phil there. I don't know if anyone wants to say anything else before uh, we close, you know, and I stop recording. Gonzalo or anybody else? Two last minutes, no? Are we okay to go? Perfect. Well, yeah. thank you all, and <laughs> tomorrow. See you tomorrow.